Right, okay, thank you. Um, I will make uh, some remarks on three points, actually. The first is about the root of the Greek crisis, but somehow in the broader context <coughs> of uh, the Eurozone crisis. The second is about the state of things in Greece now. And the third is about the political side, you know, of how is the situation now and what Syriza is trying to do in the current uh, situation. So let me start with um, somehow the Greek crisis in the broader context of um, the Eurozone crisis. Of course, the, everyone understands that the Greek crisis is part of the global uh, turbulence of the last capitalist crisis, which notoriously started in 2007, 2008, in the financial sector, and then moved to uh, a crisis of sovereign debt, uh, more specifically hitting some countries, and I'll say a bit more about this, partly due to those very generous <coughs> bailouts of which the banks have benefited, see everything Aditya has just said, part also due to the effect of, uh, well, the, the decline of, of, of growth or negative uh, growth and, and recession, properly speaking. Now, um, what is remarkable if you look at the crisis uh, affecting continental Europe <coughs> is that, of course, everyone is affected, but very unevenly. And um, Greece, from the outset, uh, appeared in Europe as somehow the weak, the weak link. And this allowed, at the very start of the crisis, if you remember, all, those, all that narrative appearing about the Greek case being something absolutely exceptional, due to, you know, the Greek pathologies of uh, those people overspending, uh, living this kind of luxurious southern lifestyle, you know, being in their country, drinking ouzo, dancing siedaki, uh, you know, not caring, not working enough, uh, uh, having their pensions at the age of uh, 40-something, and so on and so forth, having a huge and enormous public sector, because Greece is a country where, you know, nearly everyone is, uh, is, is a civil servant when he's not, of course, uh, dancing the sitaki and enjoying the sun and the beach and so on and so forth. Uh, I will not enter, I mean, if, if you, we can discuss, you know, all these points and I can't, you know, uh, one per one uh, uh, say how much they are far from, from true. Uh, but the, the crucial thing uh, is that the picture changed rather quickly. And it appeared that uh, Greece is part of a larger partner, uh, of, of, of a larger partner, which was called the pattern of the peaks. Huh? Uh, so Portugal, uh, Ireland, uh, then Italy for, for some, Greece and Spain, more obviously. Uh, now, uh, apart from the type of stereotypes, uh, which are, you know, cultural and, and, and racial, or at least racialized, which are involved in this uh, categorization, what these countries did share in reality is the following seemingly paradox. Huh? Uh, during the previous decade, let's say the first small decade, uh, the first eight years after the creation of the euro in, in 2000, uh, they had growth rates superior to European averages. Uh, all these uh, countries were often quoted as, you know, examples of success. The Celtic tiger, the Spanish boom, the great Portuguese success. Uh, many of these countries were even, you know, presented as models of virtue. Not exactly Greece, but, you know, Spain, for instance, had uh, surpluses in terms of its budget. Uh, uh, Ireland was praised for this, you know, extraordinary success due to the dynamism of, you know, its financial sector and its attractiveness to foreign investment. Huh? Portuguese is also a very virtuous country <coughs> because, you know, they are very hard-working people and, you know, they enjoy these very high growth rates. Now, what the crisis unraveled, actually, is the rather unpleasant uh, darker side of that uh, 
boom uh, of those of those years and the fact that it was absolutely unsustainable. What all these countries did share was, as you understand, the fact that they borrowed massively. And they borrowed massively for two interconnected reasons. The first is that they lost what in economics is called competitiveness. Uh, uh, which means that uh, these countries, within the context of a single currency zone, had a level of growth in terms of price. Uh, competitiveness doesn't have to do, in a way, with you know, uh, the, the real standards of living. Uh, it has to do with uh, the mechanism of prices, right? So these uh, countries had inflation rates clearly above average, and more specifically, much higher than the inflation rates of the core European countries, above all Germany, with the labour cost, the wages, uh, more or less following the rise of uh, the prices and, and, and of the inflation more generally. So, once again, this doesn't mean that you know, the wages and the labour cost in those countries are higher than uh, in the core European countries. It's exactly the opposite. Everyone knows that Portugal and Greece, more specifically, had the lowest wages in uh, Western Europe. And to that, we have to add that the share of the wages in the GDP in those two countries is one of the lowest, or probably the lowest, in Western Europe. These are very unequal countries. However, what is true is that they had a rise in the famous labour cost per unit of produced product, okay, once you uh, factor in the productivity somehow uh, growth. Which means that these countries, uh, what they were producing was becoming less and less competitive in the context of a single currency zone where the pressure of competitiveness goes directly to wages and labour costs, <coughs> actually. To give you a very, I think, simple illustration of this, uh, for people like me, uh, who have spent most of their life outside, who are Greek peoples, having spent most of their life outside Greece, it has become for us more and more expensive, incredibly more expensive, especially when, since uh, the start of the Euro, to spend our holidays in our home country. Okay? And uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, Greek tourism, for instance, although being a relatively important industry, but has clearly lost in competitiveness compared to uh, equivalent industries in other uh, European countries. Despite the fact that, once again, the wages of people working in that specific sector in Greece are much lower than the wages in Britain or France or many other whole uh, European countries. So, all these countries during that period had actually experienced massive deficits in not only their trade, uh, which means that they were importing much more than what they were exporting, but they had huge imbalances in uh, the so-called current account balances, uh, which also uh, uh, counts the capital flows and so on and so forth. Uh, and when you have deficits in your current, current uh, account balance, the only solution, of course, is to borrow. And uh, guess what? it was very, very cheap to borrow, because one of the immediate effects of the single currency was to bring down interest rates close to zero during the whole period, okay, and which facilitated borrowing enormously at all levels. Huh? This is one of the fundamental mechanisms of the financialization of the economy. And the euro and the whole single currency project is, of course, one of the main vehicles in that part of the world, of the more general trend of financialization. Now, it's like, you know, being more and more addicted somehow to a job which becomes more and more cheaper huh, during, during that very period. Huh? So you have a kind of, you know, vicious circle of that time developing. Now, the second aspect of which you are, of course, very much aware is that some countries, more specifically the peaks, but not only those, uh, were affected by those imbalances and borrowed somehow massively, but some others had increasingly huge surpluses during that period. First and foremost, Germany. Germany now quoted as a model, despite the fact that the growth rate 
of Germany was the lowest of the entire Eurozone in the past period. Despite the fact, or not despite the fact, precisely due to the fact that <coughs> wages in Germany were totally flat, totally stagnant during that whole period. And this is the key of Germany's success. This is how Germany, and this is how the Euro, in a way, and its whole architecture was from the start designed to serve the interests of German capital, more precisely export-oriented uh, German capital, because Germany had zero inflation, nearly, and completely flat wages during that entire period. Germany borrowed to the rest actually of Europe, more specifically to the BRICS. This is why at the start of the crisis, most of the Greek sovereign debt was owned by German banks, followed by other European banks, essentially French banks, actually. Now, most of, most of that debt, the overwhelming majority, has moved to European, uh, actually, institutions. So that was the mechanism, okay, of borrowing of shared by Greece and other countries. The only specificity of Greece is not that much, you know, the absolute level of indebtedness, but the fact that concerning more specifically Greece, the major part of its debt was public debt and not private debt. Contrary, for instance, to Spain where, and Ireland, where the overwhelming part of the debt is private because it was created by the bank sector, uh, which in Greece somehow remained, relatively speaking, although it benefited as well, from financialization, but it remained in, within more modest proportions, let's say, than, uh, than elsewhere. <coughs> so, that with the crisis, with the bailouts, with the recession, uh, the level of the Greek public debt became unsustainable. Greek could not refinance its debt on, in, in the markets and uh, had to sign the, fam the famous memorandums of agreements signed by the Greek <coughs> governments, the successive Greek governments. Three of them were signed in the period going from April 2010 up to, uh, up to now. This was the start of the shock therapy applied to Greece. Uh, there is absolutely nothing original in the lines of that shock therapy. This will be my second uh, point. For readers familiar, a bit familiar with what has happened in countries of the Global South, for readers of Naomi Klein's, for instance, book, The Shock Doctrine, which, by the way, became a huge uh, success in Greece uh, in publishing <coughs> these last years for very understandable uh, reasons, they know the music quite well. Huh? This is the policy of the so-called internal devaluation, which means that in order to restore competitivity, you have to bring down wages en masse, uh, cut public spending savagely in order to make surpluses to repay, uh, to repay the debt, uh, downsize the public sector and the, say, and, and the state uh, drastically, privatizing and selling everything you can, uh, you can get, and of course, as I said, dramatically uh, bringing down uh, labor costs and therefore wages. And this is exactly <coughs> what has been uh, done and put into practice in Greece uh, during uh, all, these, all these years. The only difference between Greece and the Global South is that usually the IMF, which was you know, monitoring the whole process in the countries of the Global South, combined these policies of internal devaluation with the devaluation of the currency of those uh, countries in order somehow to soften up uh, a bit the, the, the shock, something which is impossible in the case of, of, of Greece, uh, because Greece is still in uh, the single currency, so the entire pressure of the so-called internal devaluation went to labor cost. What are the results of these policies three years after? <coughs> the results of that policies is an unprecedented, unseen since the 1930s depression in Western Europe. Aditya talked before about the 4% shrinkage of the British GDP and characterized it remarkable and compared to the 2008, I think, figures. In Greece, the figure is minus 25%. Just as a reminder, only in the 1930s, only two countries internationally reached 
that level of economic depression, the United States and Germany. Uh, unemployment uh, skyrocketed from 11 to 27 percent. Official figures notoriously underestimated. Real figures are certainly above uh, 30 percent. People have lost approximately 40 percent of their income due to the drastic cuts in nominal uh, wages and the enormous boom of taxation suffered by uh, the overwhelming majority of Greek uh, households. Um, the social situation is absolutely dramatic. Element the most basic, fundamental, vital <coughs> public services have been destroyed, starting from hospitals. Okay, all the figures we have about uh, the situation of you know, public health and uh, all these figures show a depression, once again, unseen in post-war Europe in terms, for instance, of infant mortality and the expected consequences in life expectancy. Suicide rates have skyrocketed. They were traditionally the lowest in Europe and they are notoriously underestimated. Suicide has become an enormous social phenomenon in Greek society. These are just some indicators of the trauma undergone by the social uh, body in Greece. More than half a million people uh, depend on charities for uh, provision of uh, food and the Ministry of Education has now started a program for uh, giving breakfast to, I think, 70,000 <coughs> children on a daily basis. Now, the funny thing in that story, if I may say, if I may use the term funny, is that the Greek sovereign debt at the start of that shock therapy amounted to 120 of Greek GDP. It is expected to reach 170% of GDP this year, despite the so-called haircut of last year, which was actually turned out being a rather nice business for those who were holding bonds, given the situation of the time. Actually, although I do not have enough time to develop that point, what's going on now in Greece is, of course, perfectly rational if you consider that what is being put in place is a new, absolutely savage model of capitalist accumulation, which has been described by the uh, Marxist geographer David Harvey as accumulation by dispossession. I think that, you know, if you look at, for those who can follow current affairs in Greece, the best illustrations of that are the conditions in which um, the natural resources of the country are sold, given, to foreign companies uh, with an absolutely enormous environmental cost which will destroy whole areas for the generation to come. And to this you have to, to add the selling out of the best assets of the countries, what the Greek called tafileta, uh, the filets, uh, the best pieces of the meter. So absolutely guaranteed profitability sold under absolutely scandalous conditions to, in general, international capital, of, despite, of course, the fact that Greek capital uh, is, you know, Greece is still a very profitable country, huh? uh, despite the, 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 the size of the recession, despite the fact that, you know, nearly half of small businesses have closed down uh, in, since the start of the crisis, despite the fact that the streets of Athens and of the big cities of the country are unrecognizable and dark and gloomy when uh, uh, in, in, in the evening and in the night. Despite all this, Greece remains a much a very profitable country with um, a rate of profit of approximately 40%, much higher than the European average, partly due to the fact that wages have been uh, very severely depressed. Now, let's go briefly to the political aspect of things. And uh, here I want to make a connection indeed with, between Greece and Latin America. And I'm doing this on purpose. You know, Alexis Tsipras paid, uh, started a kind of trips abroad uh, in those last months by 
paying a visit actually to two countries of Latin America. He had planned to trip to Venezuela as well, actually. He wanted to start with Venezuela, but unfortunately, during the already deteriorated state of health of Chavez, uh, he had to give up the Venezuelan part of his uh, trip and went to Brazil and to Argentina. And uh, the Greek media and the government and all the, the, uh, the pro-memorandum um, uh, forces accused him of, yes, he wants to copy the recipes of Latin America and he wants, you know, to make Greece a third world, world country. Please notice the paradox, as if it was not precisely their policy which was making Greece a so-called third world country. But the interest, of course, and the real purpose of that trip is uh, to go and look at how, concretely speaking, uh, popular and social movements and <coughs> really existing governments have taken routes opposed and alternative to the neoliberal recipes and to the shock uh, theories. And indeed, what is remarkable about Greece is that from the very outset, from the very day the first memorandum was passed in Parliament, the 5th of May of 2010, those policies were met by an unseen in Europe level of popular resistance, at least since the 1970s. In less than three years, there have been in Greece uh, 26 or 27 movements of general strike of one or two <coughs> days each. Uh, many of you have probably uh, uh, followed the so-called movement of the squares in spring 2011, which was the Greek version of the Indignados, okay, of hundreds of thousands of people gathering in the main squares of uh, the Greek cities. Uh, this very high, this, this uh, extraordinary level of popular resistance succeeded in bringing down no less than two Greek governments, the government of Papandreou, forced to resign in October uh, 2011, uh, in an atmosphere which I think can be reasonably qualified as pre-insurrectionary or the closest we have seen to that type of situation in Europe since uh, the early 1970s and also forced uh, the so-called technocratic government of the banker Papademos imposed of course by the European uh, Union and uh, the banking oligarchy to call for early elections last uh, spring which opened up in you know, <coughs> Uh, new politi political and electoral uh, sequence. These popular movements uh, didn't succeed, um, I'll, I'll, I will explain that in a moment, uh, uh, putting forward their own solutions for the moment at least, but they have succeeded in destroying very largely the old Greek political system, which was quoted by political scientists as a remarkable example of political stability and well-functioning parliamentary democracy since the 1970s, since the, uh, the end of uh, Greece's military dictatorship. Uh, the Greek Social Democratic Party, which, domi Azov, which dominated political life in the country for the last nearly four decades, is now a ramp, a group school, which might not even be represented in uh, the next uh, parliament. Uh, uh, the current government is the outcome of a coalition between three different parties, because none of them <coughs> has uh, a majority of its own, the main one being the traditional Greek right-wing party, New Democracy, allied with the remnants of uh, PASOK, and a new party coming actually from uh, the left, but which aligned itself somehow with the neoliberal and pro-memorandum policies, the so-called democratic uh, left party. Uh, the old political system was destroyed, the political situation become, became increasingly polarized. Indeed, the May and June elections uh, saw an unprecedented level of class polarization in the vote in Greek society, unseen since the early 1980s, huh? with uh, 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 the working class and popular neighborhoods and constituencies voting massively for Syriza, the rising party of the radical left, the coalition uh, of uh, the radical left, and the more affluent uh, areas uh, voting en masse, but also uh, many areas in the countryside for the party of order uh, with uh, new democracy 
uh, leading it. The same type of polarization and the destruction of the old political system also opened the space in combination, of course, with uh, the extraordinary properization of uh, broad layers of society to the rise of uh, not only, not simply a far-right party, but a proper neo-Nazi force, Golden Dawn, which entered Parliament in the June uh, elections, getting 7% of the popular vote, and which now, according to nearly all the recent opinion polls, has become the third political force in the country. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Syriza's rise uh, is due to the combination of two factors. The first is the level of popular resistance and the strength of those popular movements, which, despite the fact that uh, they haven't been able, actually, to impose their own solutions and to put an end to the shock therapy, uh, at least allowed that movement of discontent and of popular protest to go leftwards and not rightwards, or to populist formations like the Beppe Grillo uh, situation in Italy. I think that the results of the elections in Italy are the perfect, if you make the comparison with Greece, are a perfect illustration of the difference it makes to have a proper left-wing force intervening in society, being present in popular mobilization, and bringing, being able to carry what appears as a credible political alternative. Because that, I think, is Syriza's uh, strong point. The fact that during the election campaign, it came with the proposal of uniting the left-wing forces uh, forming a left-wing government, and we have to say that for historical reasons the term left-wing government, or the term even left, refers to the left of social democracy uh, political space, in order to put immediately an end and abrogate the memorandums, renegotiate the debt on that basis uh, in order to write off its major part, nationalize the banking sector, uh, bring up the wages starting from uh, the minimum wage, re-establish uh, the social rights and regulations which have been destroyed by the memorandum policies. These policies, these proposals created a huge, actually, dynamic and allowed Syriza to become first the major force of the opposition and then somehow to dominate the entire left-wing spectrum of Greece. Huh? It lost, as you know, very, by a very narrow margin of only 2% the June uh, elections uh, which were won by, by new democracy. How is the situation now? Just to conclude by this, I would say that the situation in Greece is, appears now as, as blocked, actually. Um, there is a general atmosphere of nearly despair uh, due to the, the acceleration of the deterioration of the material conditions of living of the overwhelming majority of the population, due also to the feeling that you know, people have tried in a way everything. They have played all kinds of cards, direct action, collective mobilization, unprecedented levels of collective and movements and so on, vote for Syriza and, you know, the political and electoral card, and in a way, nothing, none of this proved sufficient somehow to bring a real change, a real change which is necessary for that society very simply to survive. This, I think, uh, means that Syriza has now a new responsibility, a new responsibility not only for Greece, but I think of what's happening more generally in Europe, because you, you have seen that popular mobilization has also reached unprecedented levels in the other countries more affected by the crisis, more spectacularly in Portugal, see the demonstrations just a couple of days ago and other movements, but also in Spain, in Slovenia and Bulgaria, popular movements have succeeded in bringing down uh, governments. But the difference between those situations and Greece is that in Greece, the possibility of a political alternative appears as much near than in the rest, actually, of Europe. And this, of course, uh, puts in the shoulders of Syriza, 
in our shoulders, I'm speaking here as a member of, of, of Syriza, uh, a kind of historical responsibility. Uh, it will be an illusion to think that the solution and the formation of a left-wing government with Syriza at its core will come easily. It will come only after the result of a protracted struggle and very hard uh, breaks and clashes with the Greek dominant classes and their international uh, supporters. This is the responsibility of Syriza now, to open up uh, a perspective, to bring down the existing political system and the current government and open up uh, the path to genuine social change which is absolutely necessary both for Greece but which will also give, I think, the green light for very spectacular processes of change across Europe.